Hello, and welcome to Innovations in Cybersecurity. Today's topic, awareness training is dead, let's focus on changing behavior. I'm your host, Allison Rusk with Inky, and I thank you for joining us today. Before we get started with our expert moderator and panelists, I would encourage you to participate in the discussion. The Q&A chat will be open throughout the webinar, so please type your questions for us at any time. You can also upvote questions you like by clicking on the thumbs up icon. We will answer your questions live near the end of the session, so I hope you will join the conversation. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator and panelists. Andreas Workner, founder and owner of Wilkner Securities, will be moderating today's panel. Welcome, Andreas. Hello, thank you for the introduction. And our panelists are Oz Alashe, the CEO of CyberSafe, and Dave Baggett, founder and CEO of Inky. Oz and Dave, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, great to be here. Likewise, great to be here as well. Thanks for having me. And now I will hand over to Andreas Werkner to lead the discussion. Thanks so much, Alison. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time today and to discuss with me this very, very interesting topic. And I know from many, many discussions, and you know, I was at CISO on my own for many years, there's always this topic between technology and between humans, and most of the CISOs don't like that human factor that much because it's scary, you cannot grab it, and they rather uh, talk about tools and protection mechanism. I just had the pleasure last week to meet uh, a CISO of a pretty big life science company who said, look, I don't trust people, I just don't trust humans, right, because this is so, you know, technology is black and white. I know what's going on, but uh, the humans is difficult. So let's get started. Dave, I have a question for you. You know, ransomware is a topic. Emails are still the number one attack vector for companies when we talk about cybercrime. And, you know, everyone has deployed something over the years. And I think companies have spent millions and millions and millions on security tools and awareness trainings and capabilities and all that stuff. And you talk everywhere, every report you see, we pay more ransom, we invest more money. Why is that? Why do we still see uh, this whole email thing and, and as the attack vector number one? And why do we see still increases in that space? Why don't we? Why don't we get it under control? What's wrong? What are we doing wrong? Yeah, I mean it's getting worse, right? And I think if you look at the stats, something north of ninety percent of breaches are start with an email whether it's ransomware or wire fraud or theft of money we're even seeing clever attacks like people getting you to install crypto mining on your employees machines so they steal money indirectly why is why is it so popular because it works it works right it's very effective it's also really cheap so email is an old protocol it's a federated protocol it's had some security features grafted onto it but it fundamentally has no way to authenticate people in a way that you can trust. So you can't tell who sent the mail. So it's easy for an attacker to register a plausible sounding domain. You know, we saw one recently, mssysupdate.com. Sounds like Microsoft, right? Plausible domain. They can go onto Namecheap, register a new domain with Bitcoin. It's cheap, it's literally in the name. <laughs> and they register these domains, they set up mail servers and they send the mails. The other insight that I have to admit, I was late to the to this realization, but it's so easy. If I want you, I'm, a, I'm an attacker and I want you to think I'm, say, Microsoft or some brand you trust, all I have to do is take a mail I got from Microsoft and replay that to you. And, and so it's super easy, it's super cheap, and it works. And I think the other thing is, now that we're in this new normal of either work from home or at least hybrid, everyone's at home distracted, right? And so that makes them much more vulnerable to attackers impersonating people they work with or, or, or brands that they trust. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, you know, the attackers are getting really sophisticated. So the typical once a quarter phishing awareness training is just not working anymore. So do we need to give up on, on technology? And do we really need to say we need to fight other ways just, to, just out of curiosity? 
I would say no. I mean, I think the incumbent systems are not blocking fish, and maybe we can get into some of the reasons why that we've just discovered at Inky. But I think we need to double down on involving people. I know people are scary to CISOs, but our view at Inky is to use the best of the AI and machines, also use the output of that AI not just to block bad fish, bad stuff, but to give users guidance. So one of the things we do at Inky is we inject dynamic banners that say one of 75 different things. And the purpose of that is to get the user to slow down and think before they take action on something like a wire payment or an invoice or buying gift cards. We see that sort of thing all the time. And that augments kind of the traditional once a quarter phishing awareness training that's just of limited efficacy now. So you're saying Inky is addressing it the behavior of the people that you 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 notch them to do the right thing, which they otherwise would most probably not have done, right? So it's very interesting. But also, you know, you are the you're the person who comes from the angle of cyber training, awareness, and cultural change, really. Are you saying, you know, is training dead? Is it not working? Is it just, you know, was it good 10 years ago, but now it needs to, we need something different? What, what, what are the limitations? How far can we go really today? Mm, well, I think, um, you know, I, I think Dave made some really great points and, and raised a really, uh, a few really interesting challenges for us. You know, the email is, is so important. It's so prevalent. And no matter what um, people say it's going to be for quite some time uh, in the future. So the reality is looking at how we protect ourselves against that particular attack vector is, is of course important. Um, but the question that says, you know, is uh, training worthwhile? Is it working? Is it, um, is it no longer valid? Um, really kind of needs to come back to what is it you expect from training in the first place? Because that for us at CyberSafe is what we think is really one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest flaws. And one of the reasons why we do a Agree that the traditional approach to security awareness is dead. Um, and if it's not dead, it's definitely dying. That the truth of the matter is that um, if you expect to train people and their behavior automatically change as a result of training, no matter how good that training is, you don't understand behavioral science and you don't understand behavior change. And there's much, much more that needs to be done in order to influence the security behaviors of users. And when it comes to phishing emails, there are a whole load of security behaviors of users that need to be influenced if you're going to protect your organization. So I don't think training is the answer to all of these things. In fact, I think the opposite. I think sometimes training gives us a false sense of security and comfort, but actually doesn't help to reduce risk. And there are many organizations who are training their people, providing security awareness content, that even providing phishing simulations, which in essence is another form of training, a bit of tricking and a bit of punishment all rolled in nicely together. And guess what? Their risk isn't reducing. And that's because they need to do more. So are you saying that knowing or the knowledge is not the key to success when it comes to behavior change? So that means if I know something, you know, for example, I know I should not speed, but I'm in a hurry, so I still do it. That's the same thing in, in cyber behavior and in email and ransomware stuff. So education is misleading. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Education has been a comfort blanket for us within security for a very long time. And still to this day, people hold it up as the answer to the human challenge when people are far more complex than just a set of beings that can be educated and behavior will change automatically. You gave the example of speeding. Another example I like to give is the fact that I eat so unhealthily quite regularly. I know I shouldn't eat that extra bag of crisps or indeed chips as where Dave would say where he is. I shouldn't eat it, but I'll probably eat it anyway. Knowledge and behavior are not correlated in the way that people often assume when it comes to security. And there are many, many times where we as security professionals, let alone just everyday users, we make mistakes, we make the wrong decision, we rush to do things, we take steps that ultimately are not necessarily the best decision at the time or the best behavior, and it's not to do with our knowledge or our understanding. That's not to say that improving knowledge isn't important, it's to say that to rely on training and education as a risk redu reduction mitigation uh, uh, plan is folly. Interesting. And I, I totally agree, but you know, I think in the past, most security activities were driven by compliance needs, right? And saying, okay, I need to tick a box. And I think 
both uh, what Dave said and what you just said goes in this direction. Let me ask this to both of you, but start with you as we're just talking. Is the are the compliance days over? And is it time now really to move from away and on, you know, clearly, honestly, away from compliance to risk based and to also risk focused? Are we capable of measuring and managing risk when it comes to use? Is that the step we are doing now? So I, I think it's a it's a really good question because the the truth is that compliance and the compliance requirement has driven so much of what we've done as a community. Are the compliance days over? Absolutely not. For as long as many industries will need to meet the demands or indeed the stipulations of, for example, regulators or indeed desire to achieve a certain standard, which ultimately is a compliance framework of some description, ISO 27001 and NIST. There are many others as well. And um, for as long as those things exist, people will want to be compliant. But we are seeing two things happen at the same time. One, there's a recognition that being compliant and reducing risk are not the same thing. So actually, in that sense, the days of the compliance, achieving compliance being the only thing that you need to do, those days are numbered without a doubt. They, in fact, they were numbered some time ago. But the second thing we're also seeing is actually the regulators or the standard owners are also waking up to this and adjusting what they're asking people to do. So it wasn't that long ago, in fact, only a month and a half ago, that NIST um, uh, has recently published uh, 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 insight into their own, actually just looking across security awareness in general, but specifically even taking into account their own guidance and saying it's outdated. It only expects people delivering security awareness to measure whether they have um, achieved compliance rather than to measure whether they are changing any behaviors. This is a change that's gonna affect everybody. The days are numbered. Totally agree. And I think Forrester in the Wave report mentioned something very similar, right? But Dave, how is it for you? I guess in the past, a lot of companies uh, bought your product for compliance reasons. Right? Do you see that change as well? Yeah, I think compliance, I mean, Oz is exactly right. Compliance is kind of like the absolute bare minimum and it's it's necessary, but not sufficient. And, you know, the other thing I wanted to touch on that Oz mentioned is the whole framework of the way IT and security deal with employees, I think has to change a bit in two ways. One is often employees feel it's an adversarial relationship when they're given phishing tests that are like, uh, gotcha, you failed. And, and it's, it's a very kind of, uh, yeah, again, an adversarial uh, relationship. And then we also see, you know, people will put in a tag at the top of the email that says external and they'll think, well, that's just like Pinky's banner. Well, no, it isn't because in fact, just telling somebody external that's like telling your child, be careful. No, you need to give your child specific information, like don't put your hand on the burner, right? And so I think it almost insults the user's intelligence when you give them such a general blanket warning. First of all, not all mail from the internet is bad. Second of all, telling somebody external doesn't tell them anything about how to interpret the specific mail they're reading. That's one reason why we try to make sure that the user, the end user is gonna see something they will perceive as helpful. Like, hey, potential sender forgery, this might not really be mail from Allison. We've seen her mail before. This doesn't look like something she would write. And by the way, she usually emails from North America and this mail just came from Kazakhstan. So telling the user something specific about the mail rather than giving them a generic warning involves them in it in a useful way as opposed to making it adversarial. So I think that's a really important mindset change that has to happen. The other point that I'll make is you know, we know that AI cannot completely solve this problem. And I'll give you a perfect example of why. Account takeover, right? So let's say your employee regularly gets emails from some vendor. Now that vendor's account is taken over. Maybe they don't have multi-factor auth. You can control your own infrastructure, but you can't make everybody have proper security hygiene. Now someone mails your employee from that taken over account. It's from their real mail account, right? There is no way a machine can prove that's from the person who it says it's from, right? The closest we can do is we can look at the style of language they use. We can look at other indicators, like I mentioned. It's not possible to prove it. You know, the absolute best AI in the world cannot do this perfectly. So we would argue you have to involve both the machines and the humans. And to pick up on your speeding analogy, I kind of view it like self-driving cars. It will be great when AI is good enough so it can drive you to your destination. We're not there yet, right? You can't trust your life to an AI to drive the car. 
but that doesn't make the AI useless, right? The AI can keep you in the lane. It can do following behind the car in front of you. We think of the AI similarly. Yes, there are some cases where the machine can definitively block an email that's obviously bad and provably bad, but then there are other cases where it's just not clear and we want to give the user, hey, you know, we think there's something potentially risky about this mail. And in some cases, it's a perfectly legitimate mail. Like, hey, user, this is asking you to pay an invoice. Don't do that without confirming outside of email. And what we've found is when you give users act actionable advice, not on every single mail, but on a minority of mails, like 10% of mails, 15% of mails, they slow down, they think about it before taking action, and they actually appreciate it as opposed to feeling it's hostile. I agree with that. You know, Douglas just <clears throat> put a nice comment in here. You mentioned before um, the work from home scenario, and he said, I don't believe people locations or the work from home is a valid argument anymore. Uh, people are targets regardless of the location. I think he's right. I think what you wanted to say is really that the work from home just made it worse, right? So uh, did I? Absolutely. Yeah, it makes it worse because, for example, now you're going through your inbox and your child is asking where's lunch and your dog's barking and you know, it's not a controlled environment like it is in the office. The other aspect of work from home that's bad, uh, good for attackers, bad for victims is you used to be able to walk down the hall and ask your colleague, hey, did you just ask me to pay this wire? Well, now there is no hall to walk down. You're not in, a, you're not in an office. So what I tell people is use a second channel of communication to verify the identity of senders of email, Slack, phone, SMS, right? Get out of email and contact the person about anything sensitive so you're not relying on the identity of the email sender because emails just and that's that's the one thing i think we can we can train people usefully you cannot trust the apparent identity of a sender it's easy to make yourself look like a brand or a person in an email you cannot trust the identity of the sender so for example what i tell people even if it's consumers and we only sell to companies right i tell them look if you get an email from an airline or something or amazon Don't click on anything in that mail. Go to that company's website via your web browser. Go to search, type in you know, Amazon or United Airlines. Go to their site directly that way, not via the email, because you simply cannot trust the identity of an email, an email sender. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, given what you said, especially also what Oz said, we see a move or a shift towards more culturally and behavior uh, At, well, yeah, behavior tactics towards it. What can organizations really do? Because nowadays they all have whatever anti-spam, they have security services, they have SOC who monitor stuff, they have compliance rules which look for best passwords. Maybe they are already an inky uh, customer and they have some banners which at least what what what's next right what what can people do from or what what is what would help them now say look here i am but the future is going there from from your technology point of view what should companies look like or to look at at the moment to make the next step one of the realizations that that we had we started working on phishing and inky probably six years ago and one of the realizations we had was all this phishing is getting through the incumbent systems and we asked ourselves why These are good companies with good people. They do good work. Why is all this fish getting through? And one of our insights was, if you look at, go back to the very beginning of mail protection, you mentioned it yourself, anti-spam. Mail protection started with spam filtering. So how do you make a spam filtering AI? Well, what you do is you have humans label emails as spam or ham, and then you feed the labeled emails into a statistical model, a Bayesian model. And that model starts to learn things like, Well, if the mail has lots of dollar signs in the subject, that's probably spammy, right? If it talks about Viagra, it's probably spammy. It learns these sort of content classification rules. That's a really important thing because content classification, well, in the email, that's the body of the email. That's what the sender supposedly typed, right? Here's the problem. Like I mentioned earlier, if I'm a bad guy and I want you to think of Microsoft, I can take a mail I got from Microsoft and simply replay that to you with some trivial change. Now think about the content of that mail. It's identical to what Microsoft sent, right? So that shows you there is no content classification algorithm that's going to identify phishing perfectly. In essence, what makes phishing bad in that case is not the content, but the fact that it's not really from Microsoft, right? It's the fact that it's an impersonation or a forgery. So this led us to think of phishing protection completely differently from mail protection historically. So there's a massive sea change here. That, that, that really this is about 
not just looking for bad content, but also looking for signs of forgery or impersonation. So that sea change has to be reflected in people's choices of how they build their stack to prevent bad emails from getting in. You have to have something that obviously blocks malicious content like bad attachments. You also need something that will detect signs of forgery and impersonation. And that's a completely different set of techniques. So that's one thing I would say people need to think about bad mail isn't just one thing. It's spam, it's malware, it's traditional bad, you know, malicious email, but it's also this new kind of phishing mail that's impersonation based. The other thing I would say is, and anytime anybody asks me, you know, will Inky stop account takeover? <clears throat> yes, Inky will detect account takeover, but you know what you should do first? Implement multi-factor authentication. If you haven't done that, that is the number one thing everyone should, should do first, multi-factor authentication. And in fact, what we do at Inky is anything that's sensitive infrastructure, we actually doubly guard it with physical tokens. So I have to have a physical device, USB YubiKey, to get into infrastructure where, where customer data is because we don't want to just have a, an app on the phone. We actually want a physical token too. So multi-factor auth and, and really locking down systems that are sensitive with token-based authentication, I think is really critical for companies. Mm, makes sense. So oh, the same from, from your side, you know, you know me, I believe that uh, phishing is anyhow the wrong way and that phishing will die most for the next one, two, three years and uh, hopefully it replaced by something more meaningful, at least phishing simulations, right? So that part of the of the journey. So for, from your side, Oz, what should companies do one now on the standard human compliance oriented training and awareness? What What's the next step? What's ma well, What makes them advanced? I do think it is worth considering it as you describe in steps, because the reality is that for some organizations, they're, they're not even taking care of the, the fundamentals. I, I, I hesitate to use the word basics because sometimes basics makes it sound like it's easy. It's not necessarily difficult, but we do recognize that there are challenges, there are pressures, there are um, um, competitive tensions that mean that many organizations just aren't doing some of the things that they should be doing. And Dave gave a really good example, such as implementing multi-factor authentication as an example. Um, but when it comes to steps, one of the other steps that we've seen with organizations who are implementing some of the fundamentals, they are training their people, they are using phishing simulations because they've decided that that gives them a level of comfort and a level of education for their people, and they hopefully are doing it well and implementing it well. We're seeing them use, for example, the CyberSafe solution because they want to understand not just who clicks and who reports phishing simulations, but they actually want to see why people are taking the steps that they're taking. So what is it about the um, uh, susceptibility of those individuals? And what is the fact they can use? Is it authority bias, a sense of urgency? Urgency. Is it that just some people just can't pass up on a deal? If you understand these things, you can tailor the way that you help individual users. And that's really what we need to do. And that's one of the other steps that I think is most exciting about what's happening in the what is traditionally called the security awareness space. But the reality is, as I said, security awareness is dead and or dying. And the reality is that what we're seeing now is a much more intelligent approach to managing human cyber risk managing user risk, which means that actually when it comes to phishing, you need to think about what are the security behaviors that go around everything to do with email and how do I influence those? So that might be whether people click on um, emails that they shouldn't be clicking on. That's a security behavior you want to address. It might be whether people report emails that they are suspicious. That's a great security behavior that you want to embed into the organization. You might want to get your people to check their social media privacy settings in order to see whether or not they're giving away more information than they should be, which makes it easy for people to target your organization. You might want to check whether people are reusing those specific email addresses, because reuse of email address means that those email addresses find their way onto lists, and those lists are being used by at large. These are all, these all are security behaviors that influence phishing that rarely do organizations properly address. There are so many others that I can think of. And so uh, the reality is that I think we're seeing a more intelligent approach to phishing that goes beyond phishing simulations. And actually, as I say, when it comes to security awareness, the traditional strategy of trick, train, and entertain is, again, no longer fit for purpose. Tricking people with pretty poor phishing simulations, training them and hoping that that influences security behaviors, or trying to make them laugh with funny videos so that they don't hate you, but at least you feel like you've given them some information, those are not ways to reduce your risk. There is more that needs to be done, and actually there are solutions that can help do that. And you know, Inkey and CybeSafe are two solutions that are actually a really good combination, taking this problem on from different positions, but actually in a really interesting way, recognizing that there is a scientific basis to this. 
interesting point. You know, going back what Douglas made, the, man, the, the comment he made, right? This whole working from home. I also believe when we talk about ransomware as a risk, right? To go away from the technology and whatever it is used. Ransomware as a risk for an organization has many, many facets. And you say uh, one thing which we often found in my old former organization that people are using company email addresses on LinkedIn. And guess what? They use the similar or same passwords just with a different, you know, little different changes at, at if at all. And, you know, there's so many more things, the settings at home and, you know, how do they behave in, in Starbucks or in the plane or in the train or whatsoever. So ransomware is a much wider field than just phishing. But this working from home, which Douglas mentions, shouldn't have an impact. How do you see this? Has the hybrid, and I'm not saying working from home, but the hybrid working impacted us in the, our way, how we at how we work and are we open, more open for uh, for for attacks simple reason we had a case where someone at home uh, got that we got centrally an alert and you know people didn't lock their workstations anymore because they were at home they thought it's trusted the little boy teenager went to a site which he shouldn't be and all of a sudden down tried to download something you know that that, 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 that that story right and everyone oh my god oh my god do you see this is this a valid point that at least we became more relaxed because we think it's safe it's home so my kids my family is, is that a, a valid reason I think so. I mean, I think there's a general blending of work and home life uh, that's unhelpful to security hygiene. You know, who has their work laptop right next to their personal PC at home in the kitchen? Everybody probably. Uh, the other thing is, of course, you know, as we get, it's almost like we have this flywheel that keeps going faster and faster where now you work 24 seven, you're on five different kinds of communication media. You're getting more email than ever before. You're busier than ever before. All of these things are helpful to attackers. Distractions helpful to attackers. People being overworked is helpful to attackers. So I think all that stuff factors in. I wanted to also pick up on something that Oz mentioned because it's so important to think about this. I often have people say to me, well, my company's not gonna be targeted. We're a small company. We don't have anything that they would want. We're not gonna get targeted. And, and what's really important to realize is what Oz mentioned about social media is absolutely spot on. We see every time a new employee joins Inky, and Inky is not a big company, right? Every time a new employee joins Inky, they get a fake email supposedly from me asking them to buy gift cards or something else. Do you think that's coincidence? Uh, no. In fact, there are now bots written by attackers that continuously scrape LinkedIn to get org chart information. They know exactly whose boss people are, what their title is. And they're even looking for these signals of person changes job. So you need to remember anything that's on social media is not only going to be used by attackers, but it will be used in an automated sense against you. So here's another example of where you might think the attacker has to do a bunch of work. We often see fake login pages that are, you know, linked from e bad emails, those fake login pages, of course, those are credential harvesting operations, right? The attacker wants to get the users, again, good reason to have multi-factor auth. So in those credential harvesting sites, they often look like perfect Office 365 login pages with the company's own logo. So the victim goes to a fake login page that has his or her company's logo beautifully rendered there. Now, you might think, wow, the attacker must have done a lot of work. They must have researched the victim company. No, in fact, there's a Google redirect. You can literally go to www.google.com, put in the right query parameter, domain equals whatever you want, inky.com, microsoft.com, domain equals whatever, and it will serve you up the logo for that company. It's totally automated. So all the attackers have to do is fill in their template like the old Mad Libs that you used to play as a kid. They just fill in the template and it's no work whatsoever for them. So, you know, this whole everything becoming remote and online and cloud-based is really helpful to the bad guys. I think um, I, I, all I would add on to that is that not only is this, um, you know, the space rapidly evolving, you know, as, as, as <clears throat> 
there is no doubt that um, it is becoming easier and easier for bad guys to do what they need to do or want to do. But actually, there is definitely a um, uh, a change in context as well. You know, whether actually it might even be context switching. The fact of the matter is with the way that we work now has changed. The way that we live our lives has changed. And for many of us, um, people are um, in one place or another less than they were before and so the reality is that they're flicking between different types of devices to um, read and engage whether that's reading email looking at sms uh, what they are flicking between different locations uh, different background noises different level of comforts different uh, types of familiarity all of these things contribute to the decisions that we make and therefore have to be taken into account and there's no doubt that working from home or remote working or um, hybrid working all of these things make a difference interesting before no and I, and I totally agree right see it on myself right so you you just behave a little different at home and uh, then in public spaces but you know before i go to the to the question from the audience um if we would um just to sum it up what are the three things for you or uh, someone should remember when it comes now to this whole topic ransomware phishing email what are the things to do what makes sense what gives return on investment so I think for organizations, because that's really what we're talking about here, and I suspect most of the listeners and uh, people watching this will be uh, people who are either thinking about their own organization or an organization that they are responsible for supporting the uh, information security effort on. Um, for organizations, I think organizations need to consider a number of things. Like I said, uh, trick, train and entertain doesn't work. Trick, train and entertain doesn't work. So if you are relying on phishing simulations as a method for addressing phishing, if you are relying on providing clever training or entertaining, funny, interesting training, then you're unfortunately probably not reducing the risk. You can tell that, so that's number one. Number two, you can tell that because if it is working, you will be influencing the security behaviors that matter. So be specific about security behaviors. That's really important. And then number three is, if you're talking about people and talking about security behaviors, then be scientific. There are specific behaviors that relate to specific risk outcomes. Malware infection is a risk outcome. Phishing emails are an attack method that are used to deliver um, that, that badness to your organization. And so if you can get rid of the trick train and entertain, be scientific and be specific, you will significantly reduce risk. And we can see organizations doing just that. So what, Dave, what, what's your list? Just yeah, my big three. Obviously, the first one I mentioned is multi-factor auth. If you can do it with uh, hardware tokens for sensitive data, even more important, protect yourself from getting accounts taken over. This also applies to your cloud accounts. One of the things we're seeing increasingly is we're seeing attackers compromise companies' cloud accounts. Like, for example, we saw a, a recent attack where phishing was coming from an established company. I will call them XYZ Corp, but you, they're a household name. XYZ Corp's SendGrid account was hacked. They didn't have multi-factor auth in the SendGrid account. So then the attacker is using SendGrid, which is a legitimate company SendGrid account to send out fish. Now you can imagine the challenge that presents to the mail protection systems, right? They're like, well, it came from SendGrid. Not only that, it came from a legitimate brand sending this XYZ Corp. I know who that is. So multi-factor auth to protect logins to your email, but also all of your cloud accounts and make your partners use multi-factor auth too. insist that they do too, because you're only as strong as the weakest link and everyone mailing you is now part of your security perimeter. So that's the number one thing. Number two is, again, this idea that we can't simply rely on AI to magically solve this problem. AI is great. We can block a lot of emails with AI. A lot of emails are provably malicious. We can block them. That's great. But use the AI also to give users guidance and involve them in it. And to Oz's point, think about it scientifically. If you put a big yellow warning on 100% of emails, guess what happens? People become blind to that and ignore it. So instead, put it on 10% of emails. If you tell people something's external and that's useless to them, it doesn't really tell them anything other than be careful, they will ignore that. If you tell them something useful, like, hey, this particular email is asking you to change your password, don't do that without confirming outside of email, then the users will actually appreciate that and not become blind to it. And they will slow down at those opportune times 
and evaluate the risk of the mail. And the third one is emphasize to your employees and by the way, your family members, this is a consumer problem as well as a business problem, never to trust the identity of a sender of an email. It's just too easy for attackers to impersonate brands and impersonate individuals in email. So I always say, use that second communication channel. Don't rely on the email itself. Verify it with a second communication channel, Slack, Teams, SMS, go to the website, right? Get out of the email and take the sensitive action through a trusted source like the company's website. Cool. You know, it's quite funny because now we've got a, a, quite a couple of questions in and uh, Rudolf just wrote, we have been using Inky for a while now and most people actually like the dynamic Inky banners because they can get the explanation right there when they need it, right? At the same time, we have someone who sorry don't didn't uh, mention his name that it's often uh, the it is often perceived as a bad guys when sending phishing simulation emails to employees how do employees react when they first see inky banner so you know i guess it's here more about good you know is this easy what, what's the what's the method around to introduce it some in a nice way that people are saying oh yeah that's help and it's not another control from it yeah, we have onboarding documents. So one of the things that's important to do is not to just turn them on the banners, but to explain to people, here's what you're going to start seeing and why. I think that most people, when they start interacting with the banners and, and they read them, they start to appreciate that, hey, this thing's actually trying to help me. The other thing that we do is we put a report link below our banner, whether we put in a gray banner or a yellow or a red, we always put a report link. And we've actually put under that report link a, a, a feature that users really, really like, and that is they can self-block spam. So they can basically go in, if they report a mail as spam, Inky will then ask them, oh, do you want to block all mail from this sending domain forever for yourself? And people like this because, you know, unsubscribe doesn't always work. And in fact, unsubscribe may be a malicious link. It may just be a fake unsubscribe. So this is a way that we can create value for users that makes them like this as opposed to just being viewed as oh they're they're hassling me or they're trying to put in yet another control i guess the final thing i'll mention is you know we've gotten c-level executives at our customers telling their CISO, hey what's that banner thing that's in my emails now that's really cool and the CISOs are like, this is the first time we've deployed a security product that people actually liked and knew existed. <laughs> Most security is invisible unless it's annoying, right? So I, I think that one of our, our hidden benefits actually is just that it is so visible and clearly helpful and non-hostile. And we try to really make the banners look nice and have not a bunch of lingo, but have you know language normal people will understand. We even now have the ability to put an image next to the banner so you can put your company's logo there, make it look nicer. I think, you know, we often come into a, a situation where the company has an existing external banner and it's like, they might try to make it as ugly as possible to catch people's attention. You know, we sort of have gone the opposite direction. We try to make it beautifully designed and, and, and look nice. And I think, I think people really identify that with that. And I think also, one of the things we did very intentionally was, you know, we have our cute octopus character, Inky's the octopus. One of the reasons we did that is we kind of didn't want to be talking about AI to users. What is AI? What is that stuff, right? Your eyes glaze over. But the idea that, oh, Inky's this thing that helps you, that anthropomorphizing the software, I think has been really helpful because when users report mail to us, they'll often put in, hey, great job, Inky, as though Inky is actually this creature, right? So mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of psychology behind this that I couldn't possibly, uh, you know, opine on, but there's clearly something there to connecting with users in a way that maybe is sort of unorthodox, right? I mean, it's, we tried to make it not a corporate security product by the way it looks and feels, but make it friendly. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, also one question for you, you know, uh, an anonymous user again saying uh, we are following NIST. You said we should be more scientific and use and focus on user behaviors. Where can I find uh, user behaviors uh, to start with? 
Again, it's a, it's a great question because one of the things that I think we see quite regularly is that actually when it comes to addressing this particular risk, so the challenges that are, are surrounded by e or that surround email and of course things like ransomware, um, people aren't quite sure if it's not just about clicking and reporting, what are the other security behaviors that we should be focused on? So at CybeSafe, uh, we believe passionately about being specific in security with security behaviors. And that's why we were really um, delighted to partner with the security community, global security community to develop the world's most comprehensive security behavior database. Um, actually, free open source um, research pr project called SEBDB, www.sebdb.com. will take you to it, or indeed you can go to the CybeSafe website, there are links to it. You can even go to um, uh, various analyst, uh, analyst websites, Forrester Gartner, and they'll also be linking you to the same thing. Everybody's recognized that this literally breaks down every single security behavior, not just for actual things like malware infection, but other risk outcomes you might want to be avoiding too, like identity theft or um, data, data leakage. The fact of the matter is that um, when it comes to phishing, there are some other behaviors you should really consider as well and as i've said some of those um you 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 need to do more than just just train your people um dave just mentioned it there helping people and training people are not actually the same thing so giving people a just in time banner that nudges them so uh, many of you would have heard of nudge theory um that actually does make a significant difference we see a 67 percent increase in the number of people who go on to change specific security behaviors because they receive the prompts and the alerts at the right time and we see that about all sorts of things adoption of multi-factor authentication checking of social media accounts privacy settings and of course as we've just there checking for links um, and reporting phishing emails as examples Totally agree. You know, there's one question I think you both will love, like also anonymous. I run an MSP, MSSP here in the US. Do Inky and CybeSafe have a partner program? I know from both of you, you have. Uh, I guess uh, whoever asked this question, reach out to to Allison or to us directly. You know, we have all that and uh, the question. Uh, the answer is clearly yes. Then there is a question from Ben. How would you pros, uh, propose to the business stakeholders to implement your type of solutions? What is the process journey and are there some key target milestone or expected outcome to make the journey easier? I think uh, or this is just here, maybe you start first because I think there is a lot to say. You, you answered some of it anyhow already. Yeah, I did. I gave some of the uh, uh, explanation there, but, but it's a great question from Ben because the reality is helping stakeholders understand what they're going to achieve is key. And so when it comes to deploying the CybeSafe solution, remember CybeSafe is not just about phishing. CybeSafe is actually about influencing user security behavior and measuring risk reduction over time. So the CybeSafe platform is a software solution that gets given to users that then helps them nudge and prompt and train and meet the compliance requirement all rolled into one. And so what we do um, and the process includes educating the organization as part of the onboarding, so helping the organization know what's coming, letting users know that they're about to receive this sort of help, agreeing with the administrators and the security um, professionals within the organization, which outcomes they want to affect or indeed avoid, and then which security behaviors they want to influence, and then looking at the specific security behaviors that will influence those particular, um, or the specific interventions that will influence those behaviors and measuring it. And it's that measuring piece that's really key. So there are targeted milestones Stones, but the reality is that actually it's not something that happens overnight and it's not something that can be done exceptionally uh, easily, but it is low effort and it is high reward as far as risk reduction is concerned. Dave, what's, what's your journey advice? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, if you've already done some sort of banner, you may have to retrain people that if this is a new approach to banners, you're going to like this better. We do a bunch of quality of life things with our banners. So for example, we strip them from replies so they don't stack up in conversations. We put them in the mail so that they don't interfere with the preview snippet that you see on your phone. So some of it is, in our case, we often come into a situation where there's some user hostility to the external tag or, or whatever. And we have to explain to people, no, this is, a, this is a much nicer way of doing it and it's gonna be helpful to you. The other point I would make is that often people look about look at phishing to measure click through rates and that's useful, but we have to remember we're seeing a lot more phishing attacks that don't require clicking. So for example, go buy gift cards because we're doing this giveaway. That's a scam we see rampant now. We'll see things like fake invoices, right? So you know, one of the things that we did was we actually commissioned a study with the university 
to measure the effect of our banners, not just on click-through rates, but also on you know user recognize users recognizing mail can be risky in general, whether they have to click on something and they're to be victimized or not. Um, so that's the other point I would make. It's not necessarily easy to measure all of the changes, uh, but the more creative you can get, the better. And the, and the more broadly you think about, well, what's what does it mean for my user to be victimized? What form does that take? It's not just clicking a link anymore. Good advice. I have a question for you later on regarding multi-factor authentication, but let me ask first, uh, or you know, just you will love this question from Jason. We are currently a no-before customer and have put a lot of trading in place for end users, including so far as to do one one-on-one -on -one for repeat offenders, just the word offenders, right? <laughs> Can you tell us how Inky and SiteSafe helps elevate this? So Os, let's start with you first. So I, I, I appreciate you adding in SiteSafe there because I suspect Jason is keen to understand how Inky uh, uh, alleviates the, um, the, the, the kind of challenge there. And the reality is that um, training, as we said, is a good start point. It's a really, it's an important thing to do, especially from a compliance requirement. And um, one of the things that SiteSafe does that most other providers, especially those that are in the security awareness stroke human cyber risk space don't do, is it provides just-in-time support and help for users. That means that the variety of different security behaviors that you have decided as an organization are important. You can now help by providing nudges and prompts, timely assistance for users that go beyond training. Nobody logs back into their security awareness training to just check the answer to something when they receive a quick, an email that they're not sure about. Nobody walks past their um, Wi-Fi router at home and goes back into their security awareness training just to check what they were supposed to do when they got to their Wi-Fi router. And most people don't change the default password on their Wi-Fi router, for example, not because they don't know they shouldn't, they just forget. They just, they're just busy. They did it, they, they read about it, they learned about it, they got the answer right when they did their training, but they actually forgot when it came to the right time to do it. CyberSafe provides nudges and prompts that either are automated or indeed the users can set for themselves. And that's how we elevate, alleviate this particular challenge and this particular risk. But again, that's where we're focused. I'll let Dave talk about what Inky does. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, it's a really good question. And in fact, often people ask us, well, how does Inky work if we have phishing awareness training? And in fact, we have integrations with about 30 phishing awareness training platforms. And in fact, you can say, you can tell Inky, how you wanted to treat the simulated phishing examples, right? So for example, you can tell Inky, just pretend this is a real fish and label it however you would label it, Inky. Or you can say, always label those yellow. Or you can say, always label them gray. See if we can get users to learn which are, you know, we'll pretend they're safe and see if users catch on. There's a whole different range of philosophy here. I'm not sure which is right necessarily, but it is an area where We've done a lot of work to integrate seamlessly. In terms of the repeat offenders, I think what we find is, you know, again, when you call the user's attention to specific emails, a minority of them, and we found 10 to 15% is the right range, and we actually manage this per customer. We actually track the percentage of yellows we're putting out, and if it's too high, we go in and, and try to understand why. You know, let's say the fax machine is impersonating users, that's a legitimate issue of email hygiene, but you may not want to warn about it after a while because it's just not very important, right? Similarly, like some of the cloud vendors like Salesforce, they will regularly impersonate users. That's okay as long as Inky can prove, hey, the mail definitely came from Salesforce. We can suppress that yellow warning. So part of it is tuning the nudges so that they appear infrequently so that when they do appear, the user slows down. And then, as I mentioned before, don't just tell them be careful tell them something that is related to the content of the email because that makes it feel more like oh this thing's an assistant that's actually giving me advice about this specific mail and what you find is the repeat offenders generally will slow down and start to think about it and not click and click links in yellow mails pay fake invoices and so on before i ask you the for your final statement i have two quick ones uh, the first for you, Dave, is having end users frequently change their password as important as if you ha uh, as having multi-factor multi authentication implemented? You know, I, 
it's probably controversial. I think it's not that important to rotate passwords if you're using MFA. You know, also there was this really infamous, I think, NIST guideline change that happened a few years ago where NIST actually said, don't do this crazy thing of rotating passwords every 30 days and requiring all kinds of funny characters and password length requirements. All that does is make passwords impossible for people to remember. So they write them down on their desk, right? <laughs> or they keep them in a file on their desktop or something. I actually think that password complexity and churn is a bad thing because the whole purpose of a password is for the user to remember it. I think the most important advice you can give on passwords is don't make it a word. Make it like a phrase, right? That's much harder to brute force. Easy to remember a sentence, right? Hard for the attacker to brute force. Don't use the same phrase everywhere, obviously. But yeah, I think that if you're in a multi-factor authentication regime, password rotation and password complexity are much, much less important and could even be counterproductive. Exactly. The future is passwordless, hopefully. Last question for, for us. Rudolf is asking, question, how do you see the customer's conversation as they see everywhere they need to do the train trick entertain as required by the cyber policy to get insured? So that the, the question regarding cyber insurance and they requesting us to do exactly this. Yeah, so the reality is, again, like we said, compliance isn't going away um, very quickly, and it takes many forms, whether that's compliance with a standard like NIST or ISO 27001, whether it's compliance with regulatory guidance, or indeed even whether it's just complying with the demands that are made upon you by your cyber insurer. And indeed, cyber insurers are asking organizations to make sure that you train your people increasingly. It's getting harder and harder to get insurance if you're not doing those things to, in some cases, make sure that you are running phishing simulation campaigns. And of course, good things like make sure you're implementing a multi-factor authentication, for example. These are the good things. But if those are things you're being asked to do, trick, train and entertain, then I think the key here is to just recognize it for what it is. That is not necessarily something that you have a choice about if you want to retain your insurance, but don't expect it to reduce your risk. Don't expect it to reduce your risk. And actually, for each of those things, trick, train and entertain, you can replace it with a better version. Training is good, but again, realize it for what it is. Phishing simulations that just expect people to click and or report I'm not giving you nearly as much information and data as you need. And there are more security behaviors. And I said, entertainment, it doesn't make any difference how much you make people laugh, how fun they find it, how many stars, what score they gave it afterwards. If they don't actually go and change a behavior and you weren't really clear about which behaviors you were trying to influence and measuring it, then you've actually probably wasted quite a lot of time and a lot of money. So just because cyber insurance requires you to do it, doesn't mean you should necessarily see it as a bad thing. Do those things as well as you can, but recognize them for what they are and actually make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to reduce risk too. Cyber insurance is important. So it is worth making sure you stay on the right side of that. <laughs> totally agree with this. So given that we are getting to the end, Klaus, uh, what's, what's, what are your closing thoughts? What do you want the people to go away with us? Well, we've just touched on one of those, which is, um, again, the strategy trick, train and entertain is not enough. But actually, that's not a defeatist approach either. There is more that can be done, especially if you focus on the security behaviors that matter and helping people, assisting people, giving them the support that they need at the time that they need it, giving them the tools to be able to get the nudges and the prompts and turn for just in time help. These things are game changers and they are proven game changers because actually rather helpfully we're measuring as much as possible so you should be able to see it reflected in the data how many security behaviors have we influenced this week this month this quarter and are they the behaviors that matter to us so that would be my final takeaway focus on security behaviors be specific measure those that you can cool dave what's your closing statement I think to touch on something that you mentioned earlier, Andreas, don't view users as a problem. Use that, view them as an asset. And one thing that I've really come to realize working on phishing is making a machine recognize, for example, what brand an email appears to be from is really, really hard. That's a hard computer vision problem. But think about the fact that we all do this in our brains instantly without even thinking about it. The whole reason that phishing works is because our brains are so incredible at recognizing indications of brand, for example, or indications of, hey, I know this person. So the human brain is amazingly more capable than AI still. 
Yes, there are pockets of AI that do better than human brains like chess playing and so on. But you want to have your users' human brains involved in your defensive perimeter. And so when there's something that you can tell them that will activate their brain and make them think, hey, yeah, wait a minute, is that really Allison? It doesn't really look like something Allison would send. And that's probably why Inky said it's a potential sender forgery. I'm not going to reply to this. I'm going to go and verify this now. Use your users' brains as part of your security defenses. Don't treat your users as the problem, is the advice I would give. Mm -hmm. Totally, cannot agree more. Whenever I see organizations say users are the weakest link, I'm getting nervous, right? Because you know exactly where this is going. Because it's all about technology, it's all about IT and not about people, not about supporting and helping. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. It was a very good, very interesting session. Liked it a lot. And with this, I will hand over now back to Alison. Thank you guys. Thank you for some fantastic dialogue, Andreas, Oz, and Dave. And with that, I'd like to thank our audience for joining the conversation today. If you would like more information about the Inky email security platform, visit us at inky.com. And for more information on the CyberSafe Behavioral Risk Platform, visit cybsafe.com. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much.